Welcome to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson, Certified Financial Planner and Managing Director of Polaris Capital Advisors. Today we're going to be joined by Barbara Hawley later in the show to discuss life insurance, which is something that none of us necessarily love to talk about, but we have to talk about, and it's always changing. So uh, we look forward to the information that she's going to provide for us later in the show. And I'd like to change things up a little bit with our opening today. Usually we talk about what's been going on in the market. This week I'd like to address two viewer questions that we received that I thought were actually very timely. Um, the first question is, where should I put my excess cash that's coming out of CDs, short-term bonds, right now, when we have interest rates that are negative <laughs> short-term and 2% over 10 years, where do you put your short-term cash? Excellent question, get it all the time. We usually, uh, well, two things that you would usually hear. One, short-term bonds. We certainly do use um, short-term muni bonds when appropriate in taxable accounts. That's one area that we put it. Another place that you hear a lot about is high yielding, high dividend yielding stocks. And a lot of money has been flowing into those high dividend yielding stocks as we've had a negative market. And that can actually turn around to bite you because as money is going into those high dividend yielding stocks when the market's going down, as the market starts to turn around, those stocks tend to lag the rest of the market. So while that's sort of advice that you hear often on TV or you know, something that you read online, uh, that sometimes can turn around to bite you. So my best advice when looking at what to do with that cash is one, make sure you have enough cash set aside for peace of mind. And number two, with that excess cash, anything above and beyond your rainy day fund, just look at the basic allocation that you already have. What do you have in stocks? What do you have in bonds? What do you have in growth? What do you have in value? And allocate cash according to that same percentage. Don't use now to be a time that you make vast changes in your portfolio. So that's one great question that we got from a viewer. Um, next question that we received that I also thought was excellent is what is tax loss harvesting? You've discussed it on the last two shows. What is it exactly? In a nutshell, tax loss harvesting is taking advantage of any stocks that have actually or any securities that have declined in your portfolio, selling those, those securities now so that you can take that loss hopefully netting them against gains that you have had in other times, either historically uh, or this year. And this year is a really interesting example because earlier in the year we had a very strong market, so hopefully you have some gains that you were able to take earlier in the year. Now, now that we've had a decline of say 9, 10%, now you might have an opportunity to sell some of those securities that have declined, net the gains against the losses so that you wind up with a lower tax bill or maybe no tax bill. That's called tax loss harvesting. It's something that you really want to look at throughout the year and not just at the end of the year. So those were two viewer questions that we received that I thought were really timely given everything that's been going on in the market and what we've been talking about here on Money Matters. So please forward us your questions. I love them and I'd love to answer them uh, on the air for you. So we will be back in just a minute. First, we're going to hear from David Kroll with his Mortgage Minute, and then we'll be back with Barbara Hawley to discuss life insurance and life insurance planning. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Emily Johnson, and we'll be right back. Hello, this is David Kroll, and I'm here to give you your Mortgage Minute. Uh, topic today is financial products and the internet. I want to just deliver a very strong recommendation and that is that you never shop for financial products over the net. It's a way of opening yourself and, and exposing your, yourself to financial fraud and uh, there is no way that you can do the, the, the uh, third party do, do due diligence that you need to in order to get the job done correctly. You need to speak to someone like myself, you need to speak to somebody like Emily, um, uh, financial products and the internet don't mix well. Thank you. Welcome back to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson and I'm joined by Barbara Hawley of the Agents Marketing Group. Barbara is a chartered financial consultant, a chartered life underwriter and insurance specialist extraordinaire with uh, a fabulous brokerage firm based in St. Simons, Georgia? Athens, Athens Georgia. Athens, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. um, so tons to talk about. I mean, life insurance is an ever-evolving, very confusing 
product and process for anybody who has ever uh, gone through looking at all the you know the illustrations etc certainly yes yeah so you know talk to me a little bit about just you know about how life insurance has changed about the products that are available and that type of thing well, um, just uh, basically, if you're getting uh, term life insurance, you have term life insurance, you have a The biggest bang for your buck. Biggest bang for your buck, mm -hmm. most protection, smallest premium, and um, always a, a, a product that's probably needed to cover um, you know, a, a need for a, for a death benefit and protection. So that's um, one that somebody, term insurance is something that somebody like me would use you know, when I have a young child that's going to have a college education, I have a mortgage, et cetera. And you know, right now I'd only want to out, uh, outlay a certain dollar amount towards term insurance as opposed to a more expensive type of permanent insurance. Absolutely, and and uh, term insurance is um, a, a less costly route to life insurance. Mm -hmm. However, there are many uh, uses for life insurance and different products that actually really. Uh, you have to kind of evaluate that. Mm -hmm. uh, typically speaking, um, everyone wants a life insurance policy. It's got a lot of uh, death benefit and a low premium, but mm -hmm. um, you also have uh, to think of a uh, future, where you're going to go with that life insurance and how long it's going to be needed. Right. Um, so like in this, you know, in, in my case, I might be paying a low premium for this term insurance. It'll terminate in, say, 20 years, which is probably when my need is going to terminate. Right. Um, although, who, who knows? Well, that's, your, that's your the need, big question. Your, your need is probably not going to terminate. Um, that's why a life insurance company uh, prices their product. It typically runs out in term products. They typically run out just before you actually need them to pay. Ah, Permanent okay. life insurance is a life insurance product that's going to pay a death benefit someday. The pricing is the pricing structure is different, but um, term life insurance is just for uh, the unexpected. It's mm -hmm. true risk insurance. Permanent mm -hmm. life insurance is priced to uh, to to go the long haul for you. So, permanent life insurance. Give me some other names for permanent life insurance. Permanent life insurance is um, uh, universal life insurance, mm -hmm. uh, guaranteed uh, with secondary guarantees. You've got whole life insurance. You've got variable life insurance. So a number of these products, anything other than term. Term is for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Term is what we say is renting mm -hmm. the apartment versus buying the house. Right. Okay? Right. So that's kind of the difference in the term and the whole life and, um, and the various products on the market. So I have a lot of clients that will walk in my office and they have whole life insurance and it's a policy that they bought 15, 20 years ago. They still have it inside their really pretty, uh, you know, Manila. folder exactly <laughs> that it came in is sort of yellowing around the edges but you know it's a basic whole life insurance policy that's mm -hmm. permanent life insurance but I know that life insurance has evolved over the years uh, into something a lot more complex than that so can you walk me through some of the different kinds of whole life insurance and some of the differentiators sure um, I'm going to call it permanent life insurance products okay. versus whole life insurance because whole life insurance truly is an industry name okay. for uh, typically speaking, it's a policy that is owned. Uh, it's a policy that is uh, comprised of cash value. Mm -hmm. It could be a participating um, from a mutual company that actually experiences dividends, or it could be a contractually guaranteed product. But uh, um, permanent life insurance products come in a lot of different um, um, settings. You have the I mentioned universal life. Mm -hmm. Universal life insurance products are actually. Um, Created, they uh, they have a um, uh, insurance premium that rises each year with your age. Okay. So whole life insurance product, you basically purchase that product at say age 20, and that premium is set at age 20 for the life of that contract. Which is forever. Yes, yeah, just forever. You okay. know, because it will pay a definite someday. Uh, if I'm 110, it will still pay. 110, um, you know, maybe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all, all, yeah. All life insurance policies actually. Uh, endowed at mm -hmm. age 100. They would endow okay. at age 100 today. You could actually have a policy endowed at age 120, meaning that the um, cash value is now equal to the death benefit okay. of the policy. Um, but the, uh, I'll tell you something that's really hot on the market and has been for the last couple years, and that's uh, universal life. A lot of people in the past have experienced a very negative uh, universal life uh, policies because they were underfunded mm -hmm. and they were bought at a time when the market was at 10 or 12 or 15 percent. So explain to me underfunded. I know that there's multiple moving parts of life insurance in general. You have the premium that you pay in and then a portion of that premium is actually maintained inside a permanent life insurance model right. and that's the cash value that you're talking about and then a portion of that premium goes to pay for the actual insurance component. Yeah. So when you say underfunded, which one of those pieces are we talking about? In the old days, people actually sold life insurance policies and they went in and minimum funded, or in other words, they said, in order for you to put this $1 million policy on your life today, the minimum premium I can accept from you is 
you know, $100 a month. Okay. But that was really based on your age 30. Right. Now you're age Perfect 60. Perfect health. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, now you're age 60 and the cost of life insurance has increased from 30 to age 60 each year. Mm -hmm. So the cost of insurance now experienced to that same amount of $100 premium that you placed in the policy right. is now no longer enough because the insurance company, back when interest rates were 12, 14 percent, was able to earn a lot more money on my hundred dollars than they now can with the four percent that they're earning on my hundred dollars. So therefore, right. I have to come up with more money in my premium to make sure that I can maintain That's right. that same level death benefit. Okay. In defense of the market, um, the uh, the underfunded life insurance policies and, and folks being upside down on life insurance policies and and the disappointment that occurred and you know all the horror stories that as insurance professionals mm -hmm. we've all endured. Um, several years ago, the market came out with what's called a secondary guarantee product, where mm -hmm. they actually come in with the same universal life product. But uh, they spread that risk over, like if you're uh, 40 and you're going to buy a life insurance policy, they're going to spread that risk from 40 to 120. And they're going to um, actually have you overfund the policy. 40 to 100, like years old? Yeah, 40 years old. Wow. To, okay. So they're going to, well, the product's going to last to age 120. Mm -hmm. So they're going to take and, and, and ask you to pay a little more at age 40 versus mm -hmm. the old policies that underfunded mm -hmm. and let you come in for a So that was their fix yeah. on making sure. Yeah. Now, tell me really quickly, what is the importance of the underfunding? Because I know we use a lot of life insurance in our office to assist with estate plans when attorneys you know, send us estate cases. We'll use life insurance to help them create liquidity for their estate. Mm -hmm. If it's underfunded, if we set up a plan and then in the future it's underfunded, well, what happens? You know, again, if you have a policy that's underfunded, uh, say you're 20, you're now 65 or 70, and all of a sudden the insurance carrier writes you a notice uh, for your annual premium, and you'd been paying, let's say, you know, eight thousand dollars a year. You're going to get a premium notice for about twenty thousand dollars, and you're like, "What happened there?" I don't have that cash. Don't right. have that twenty thousand dollars. What happened? The policy was underfunded. Okay. It wasn't properly structured to last a lifetime. And therefore, if it's set up for an estate plan, the estate plan might not actually work. Yeah, you could actually. Okay. Yeah, you can actually, you know, sink the ship. Okay. Uh, but, but again, today I think we're all ahead of that. Um, we look for guarantees and products. Mm -hmm. We look for uh, appropriately pricing things, and and we aren't the bottom of the market, I would assume, and so we're hoping Here's for, hoping. Yeah, so we're hoping <laughs> we that we're going to have way. some uh, more positive, uh, uh, you know, more positive uh, investment experience in the future, mm -hmm. so that as we plan and price and, and, and do guaranteed products today, that it can only look maybe better in the future. But insurance companies are very, they're very conservative in the way that they invest their funds. Typically, uh, yes, typically, um, um, all of your a, A plus rated okay. companies are going to be conservative in okay. protecting. And, uh, you know, we have what's called reserves. Uh, there are a number of, you know, the, there are a number of reserves per premium dollar that have mm -hmm. to be set aside to help make that policyholder whole. Okay. Even in the um, aspect of a negative environment and mm. on the returns. Well, let's break there for just a second and uh, we'll be back in another minute to okay. uh, discuss a little bit more about the different types of insurance and how they can be helpful for you. Okay. Be right back. This is Money Matters. Welcome to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson and I'm joined by Barbara Hawley and we are talking about life insurance, the ever-evolving financial product that eludes a lot of us. So we've been talking a little bit about universal life insurance and just insurance in general. Tell me, you know, if, if I am seeking life insurance, I have term insurance now, should I assume that 10 years from now I can just go to the market and seek permanent insurance? Um, really, really good topic. Um, Emily, my most important message I think uh, throughout the market and for uh, consumers as a whole is um, purchasing life insurance is a privilege, it's not a right. Um, you actually you have never to think about purchasing something yeah. as a privilege, certainly, because you're handing your money yeah. over to somebody, but well, you're right. And you think about life insurance, it's always a leveraged dollar. Mm -hmm. So that's where the privilege comes in. You're going to give me one dollar, I'm giving you three dollars worth of benefit back. Right. So that leverage is a privilege. Mm -hmm. And uh, and again, um, what most people don't understand about a term life insurance policy and why permanent, the sooner the better, um, is that uh, your insurability over the years, one doctor appointment, one visit, one 
um, uh, incident out in public and you're you have a whole new medical diagnosis mm -hmm. and so you and know, therefore your little, cost, and therefore of, your cost of insurance goes up. or your ability to purchase if at all is, mm -hmm. is now uh, in jeopardy so it's kind of like having a bad credit rating trying to get a absolutely. mortgage absolutely yeah. and this you know a rule of thumb I have is that there is some amount of life insurance you're going to need to own for the rest of your life and that is the goal is to get that amount of insurance purchased in a permanent plan mm -hmm earlier as the price is set and fixed? That's a really good question though. So how do you determine that earlier in life? Uh, you know, if at that time you have, you know, you're starting out in business, you, you know, have a young family, may have more children, uh, et cetera. You also don't know what your estate's gonna look like. Mm -hmm. How do you determine how much insurance is going to be needed. I often think about it from an estate planning perspective, mm -hmm. but I guess you could also think about it from a needs perspective. So how do you yeah. help people determine how much insurance I, they um, need? I would like to say that there is a uh, formula, and I know uh, insurance um, actuaries, uh, uh, underwriters, they all have a formula. They're like, well, 10 times your income. Mm -hmm. If you're in this age bracket, you need this. And my thing is, is that I don't like to use formulas. I like to sit down with the client and determine what their needs and values are. Mm -hmm. Where are you going? Where are your children going to school? How mm -hmm. much is needed? What, are, what, what does your debt look like? Right. What is your income? I mean, there's a human life value assigned to everyone based on what their um, w w what your occupation is. Right. You know, a, a doctor who's earning, you know. $500,000 is going to need more life insurance. And, and can get more life insurance. Absolutely. That's a good point. Yeah. If you're earning $100,000, you can't yeah. necessarily go out and get $5 million worth of life insurance no matter how healthy right. you are. Right, right. Um, you, can't, you can't make $30,000 and have a ton of cash coming in the back door and go buy a lot of life insurance because right. you don't qualify. Mm -hmm. um, but again, so you have the health factor and you also have an income factor right. and an estate size factor that's involved in all right. of this? Right, and as state, um, you know, is an ever-changing and evolving, um, you know, we've, we've gone from uh, 600000 to a million, two million, five million currently. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you one thing about estate tax planning. Uh, estate taxes are never going to go away. In the history of our right. lifetime, they've always been there. They're not going to go away. So right. if you're looking at inherited money or if you have assets now, Unless you want to just go ahead and you know you know take your liquidity and pay estate taxes, you need to be planning with Which a professional. It's actually low right now, isn't the estate taxes is thirty five percent right now? And historically, it's been upwards of fifty five percent. Right, right, right. right. Um, we're also in a historically low uh, uh, transfer. I mm -hmm. mean, currently 2011 and 12, we're able to actually transfer up to five million dollars per right. person. Which again, I don't look for that to it's hang in, around for right. you know long. I don't. I don't think that's going to stick with us. But anyone who wants to do some really good estate tax planning should probably look at looking at some of those transfers now. Right. I agree. So tell me if they're doing those estate tax transfers now, and just in general in the financial planning process. Life insurance is something that we always need to review because it oh, is always changing. So absolutely. tell me the factors that you look at when doing a life insurance review and somebody that's sitting at home right now, if they pull their policy you know, out of their lockbox and we're looking at it, what should they be looking at? I think that uh, probably the thing that I find that um, in a policy review, uh, most important, make sure you know who owns that policy, who's going to be the beneficiary of that policy. That seems so simple. but It seems you know. simple. I see it all the time. Lives change. Uh, Ex-wives are in the picture. Other mm -hmm. children, people, people who've passed away premature, prematurely, even prior to the death of the, uh, the owner, mm -hmm. you know, the intended. Uh, things just change so much that, I mean, honestly, I don't think people really enjoy being sold life insurance, but I think that they really That's do sure. enjoy working with professional people. And so I would say that a policy review is ultimately reported in your life as far as your, it's a financial product. Uh, you absolutely need to find a professional that you trust and, and, and review on a basis. Uh, the other thing I would say about reviewing a life insurance policy is that uh, you have to make sure that that policy is still performing. As how intended. many years would you say, if you haven't looked at your policy or viewed your policy, how many years would you say, you know, as your cutoff, you have to take a look at that policy? Uh, Things are changing. You know, I would say uh, five years max. Max. Okay. I, I would want to look every five years, but I will tell you again, values and policies matter. Um, what you think you bought matters. Okay. Have a professional take a look at what you have and, okay. and have that evaluated. Have it evaluated again in five years. Make sure it still fits what you need. Perfect. Well, that's really, that's fantastically helpful. I really appreciate it. And hopefully you can come back in 2012. I'm sure when the rules oh, will change yes. and give us some more we'll information. Wonderful. So, thank you very much. And we will be back in just a minute with the closing of Money Matters.
Welcome back to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson, and I'd like to close with a few parting shots from our show today. Number one, I'd like to refer to what Barbara Holly was just, just talking with us about, and that is life insurance reviews. Very, very important to do of your existing life insurance policies. If you haven't looked at them within the last five years at a, at a maximum, um, please take a moment to take them out of your lockbox, take a look at the key factors, go over them with a professional. It's a key part of your financial plan. Please take a look at it. Number two, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the market. Not a whole lot going on this week relative to other markets. I hazard to say that right now um, as we're filming on a Tuesday. Uh, but it has been a very tumultuous market. My one piece of advice and certainly something that we're addressing with our clients right now is stick to the plan. Don't use this time to make drastic changes. Stick to the plan that you have in place. If you don't have a plan, make sure you go and get one. Talk with a professional and make sure that you put a plan in place that's appropriate for you, that's risk adjusted to your risk tolerance and, uh, and stick with that plan right now. So that's, uh, that's our show for today. Thank you very much for joining us on Money Matters. We look forward to seeing you next week. One quick thing, please check us out on Facebook. Please forward us your questions. Please send me your emails with questions. I really look forward to addressing them and uh, look forward to your topic ideas as well. Have a great week and we'll see you soon. I'm Emily Johnson. This has been Money Matters.